today, I, I'll be taking you through the MIGO Opportunities Trust. Um, so we have um, just uh, completed our, our interim results, uh, but the data goes uh, over to just uh, the end of August, as we've just had um, our AGM. Pleasingly, we've had a, a positive and decent return, both at a NAV level and at a share price level. The discount uh, remains uh, very tight at only 2.6%, uh, which we're very pleased about. And this is a product um, of us managing um, the shares in the market, doing lots of buybacks, and then we see an overhang. And our gearing is around a 6.5%, which is uh, much higher than we normally have it. The last time the trust was geared was actually in 2020. Um, this is just really uh, a symbol of um, how interesting the um, opportunity set is. Um, in investment trusts at the moment. So for those of you who are maybe not as familiar with the uh, trust, we have been established for over 20 years. This year was our 20th uh, anniversary. Uh, my colleague Nick Greenwood launched the trust um, to, um, um, sorry, uh, 20 years ago. Um, and we uh, are looking for um, overlooked and uh, unloved opportunities in the investment trust world. So discount opportunities where we can see a catalyst uh, for that discount to narrow and to us, for us to extract that value. We have an unconstrained mandate, which means that we can invest in anything as long as it's held in that closed ended um, uh, uh, fund. We have very low correlation to mainstream indices and we offer lots of diversification as we can uh, invest in lots of different asset classes uh, and in different geographies. Um, and what we're looking at is finding those opportunities in under-researched uh, investment trusts that have fallen below the radar and are um, trading at wide discounts. So as I said, uh, my colleague Nick launched the fund 20 years ago and I joined him uh, around seven years ago. And one of the biggest changes for the trust uh, over the past year has been our move to asset value investors. Um, what we've been really pleased about is the fact that AVI uh, is an investment trust specialist, both in terms of investing in investment trusts and also running investment trusts. Um, so uh, we think it's a great home uh, for ourselves. You might be familiar with some of the um, AVI stables, so AVI Global and AVI Japan, uh, both are investment trusts. Um, and uh, AVI Global also invests in some close ended funds themselves. So we think uh, very collegiate, very collaborative, uh, and we're very pleased with our new home. So a quick overview of what MyGo does. Um, the investment thesis, as I've said, is to find discount opportunities. Our investment objective is Sonia plus two, which is, we think, a decent indication of cash. Um, the reason that we don't have um, a proper benchmark is uh, it's very difficult to have a benchmark um, against what we're investing in. And also we're looking for um, just finding the best opportunities rather than trying to worry about uh, what an underlying benchmark is invested in. Uh, performance um, over the life of the trust has been very pleasing and we've outperformed uh, our cash benchmark by a considerable amount. Uh, we don't have a dividend policy. Uh, we just uh, 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 put out a dividend um, for the last two years, but that's because we've had uh, really high yielding trusts, and I'll come on to that uh, why that is a bit later. But we tend to be looking for a total return capital growth strategy. So we're not a uh, not a not an income uh, trust, uh, but we have paid a very small dividend uh, for the last two years. And as I mentioned uh, uh, at the beginning about our uh, tight discount, we do are very active around the buyback and issuance trying to keep equilibrium in the stock market so that we keep that discount tight. It's been a very difficult time uh, for investment trusts over the past 18 months. So that buyback has been used uh, far more than uh, any issuance. We haven't done any in the issuance for a couple of years now. Uh, but we do try to buy back uh, whenever we see an overhang in the market to keep that discount tight. We have just gone through our three year realization opportunity. Uh, with 5.3% of shares being redeemed. Uh, this was slightly larger than we were hoping, but we um, 
Uh, but, you know, in terms of how difficult the, the market backdrop has been for investment trusts, you know, we do think that this is a this has been a success. And we're delighted that we've got another three years to, to perform for shareholders. So we have an ABCD um, of um, the investment case. So we describe it as a one stop shop for closed ended fund access. Uh, lots of people can see that there's interesting opportunities in the investment trust world, but it's, people uh, find it difficult to be able to do the in-depth research and finding the opportunities. We you know, describe ourselves as a one-stop shop for uh, interesting areas of the investment trust world. B is always a bit awkward uh, when talking about uh, myself and Nick, but both of us have a lot of experience in this area um, and have been managing money in this way for a long time. Uh, we're looking for catalyst-driven investments, and we'll talk about more about our process uh, in the future, but um, we are always looking for a way to extract that value rather than just sitting on large discounts. Uh, and finally, discounts, discount opportunities, finding value in a really interesting area of the market. So why is uh, the investment opportunity so interesting at the moment? Well, as you can see from this graph, this is the graph of the average discounts in the investment trust sector. As you can see, uh, it's very rarely over the history of the investment trust being so wide. Uh, we saw it in the GFC in 2008, um, which is this uh, circle here. Um, and we saw it in COVID uh, in 2020, which I mentioned earlier was the last time we had gearing on the trust. Um, but as you can tell from, you know, from this graph, you can see that in COVID and even in the credit crunch, uh, discounts, you know, uh, went wide, but they also snapped back very quickly. Um, and what we've seen, which has been quite different uh, in the market this time, has been that discounts have gone wide and stayed pretty wide, which has been, you know, in, in some ways, an excellent opportunity for us to be building a really interesting portfolio of trusts, you know, just at the wrong price. Um, but it has mean that it has meant that there's been an awful lot of headwinds for investment trusts over the last 18 months, um, hence these really, really wide discounts uh, in the market. So one of the reasons, or one of the main reasons why investment trusts have been uh, so uh, hard hit has been the rise of interest rates. We've seen over the past uh, sort of you know, five to 10 years, um, an absolute, a huge amount of investment trusts that were launched in order to um, create income uh, for investors when guilt yields were very, very low. Um, the rising interest rates has meant that most investors have gone back to more traditional forms of income, um, such as guilt, um, and therefore have left the investment trust sector, leaving lots of these alternative investment trusts on large discounts. We do think that interest rates have peaked uh, and we've seen the first rate cut from the Fed last week. We've had the Bank of England cut rates earlier this year, and that should be supportive for uh, lots of these trusts um, and entice investors back into this area. On the other side uh, of this Venn diagram, because investment trusts, because closed ended funds have been um, on very wide discounts, uh, we've seen some upsets. Um, during uh, the past 18 months it has meant the rise of corporate activity. So we've seen more activists um, on shareholders, on shareholder registers. We've seen mergers, acquisitions, realizations. We've seen trusts uh, losing their continuation vote. And this is all helpful for extracting value for shareholders. So what it's meant is that we have a situation where the headwinds of the last 18 months uh, should be coming to an end. Uh, first of all, interest rates. Second of all, you may have seen that um, the ongoing charges uh, no longer have to be uh, put out by investment trusts. That's another uh, massive headwind that is no longer applicable. And we've seen corporate activity, which has created another tailwind. So interest rates from being a headwind has turned into a tailwind. We've seen the um, removal of ongoing charges and we've seen an increase in corporate activity. So it's a really exciting time uh, in the trust world, I think. So a little word on our investment process, how we look at the world and how we create our portfolio. So we start with our universe, there's around 600 trusts. Our first question to ourselves is always, is it trading at a discount? 
Uh, this is normally, um, you know, considerably less trust than it has been over uh, the last little while. Uh, there's been more and more of things that have fallen into our into our um, uh, area. Uh, but we're always looking for these the opportunities where you can buy good assets for a fraction of the price. Uh, do we like the asset class? This is really important. You can see uh, on the graph on the top right hand side of your screen is that what we're looking for is we're looking for a powerful combination of a rising NAV and a narrow discount. If a NAV goes up uh, 20, 30 percent, that's absolutely wonderful. But if you can buy something at a 20, 30 percent discount and that share price um, uh, comes into NAV, uh, then that's a really powerful combination for returns. So we're not looking for situations where um, the, the, you know, the discounts just wide. We're looking for a combination where we think the underlying assets are really good and that discount should narrow. Do we have confidence in the NAV? This is increasingly important uh, in the sector where we have um, lots of alternative assets. There's lots of different ways um, of valuing them. Um, and we spend a lot of our time working out the secondhand value of some of these assets, um, how are they being valued by uh, the company, how are they being valued by the shareholders. Again, this is important because uh, we have a lot of um, private equity uh, in the trust, so we're looking at how that is valued uh, and comparing them, uh, comparing the different trusts um, against each other. Um, is it over leveraged? Again, this has been something that's become incredibly important um, as interest rates have risen. We've always been described ourselves as being pretty allergic to, to leverage. And, you know, we've seen over the past uh, little while with interest rates rising that trusts who uh, had taken on too much debt found themselves in a much more difficult uh, situation. Uh, so we tend to um, avoid trusts that, that have too much underlying debt. And finally, is there a catalyst? So there'll be, there's lots of trusts that trade on wide discounts and will continue to trade on wide discounts um, because there is no catalyst to extract the value. Um, what we are seeing, and we'll talk about it again a bit later, is because we've seen more corporate activity, um, catalysts are coming through uh, more and more um, at the moment, and, and that's quite a, a quite an exciting development for, um, for our industry. So we have an investment shortlist, um, from there, we do lots of due diligence and meetings um, and work on the underlying portfolio. So it's very easy to talk about what we, you know, our investment process, but um, it's always good for people to be able to see it in action. So uh, one of our uh, trusts we've had, um, it's been uh, one of our successes, is Shahalian. Um, this was bought in November last year. It's a Bailey Gifford run trust. Uh, that invest in early stage private companies. Um, and the market um, had assumed that with rising interest rates, um, it would be much harder for these earlier stage companies to access capital um, and they would um, really struggle in the, in the new environment. And we always describe, um, or we often describe lots of these opportunities as an arbitrage between perception and the reality. So the perception of the market was that these um, underlying companies would struggle, um, that the new environment would be very tough for them. Um, but you know, we did a lot of digging around in in um, uh, in the portfolio, and lots of these companies were actually more mature than the market was giving them credit for. But the trust had fallen onto a, onto a very wide discount, um, and we initiated our position in November 2023. We've seen over the, you know, over since since November and up until July, um, that the um, share price um, has done very well. Uh, that discount narrowed dramatically. We sold a lot of our position uh, in July uh, when the shares hit 100, 103. Uh, they have fallen back a little bit um, over the past uh, month or so, um, but so we have a, a bit of a bit left of the uh, of this. Uh, this trust, but the vast majority of it was sold into into that um, uh, into into the share price strength. Again, another example uh, of our investment process is uh, Tufton Oceanic. Um, in terms of the underlying NAV, we think the macro is very supportive for ship leasing. Uh, increasing environmental regulations means that the supply of ships um, is quite muted. Demand remains reasonably strong. 
Um, we've seen problems uh, in the Red Sea and uh, bottlenecks uh, being created um, across the globe. And what you'd normally see is that, trust, is that ships were able to um, merely go faster around the world in order to try and uh, mitigate these problems. But with increasing environmental regulation, that just hasn't been the case. And that's pushed uh, charter rates higher. Um, the trust was trading on a wide discount. And uh, what we've seen here is the trust announcing that they uh, would, at the beginning of the year, they tra the trust announced that they would be selling two of their ships and returning that capital back to shareholders. And you can see from the very healthy return, total return, that that came to fruition um, uh, a couple of months ago. Um, and that the trust would be uh, start winding itself down in uh, managed wind down about around 2028. So again, just a good example of sort of process and practice and, and what we've been investing in uh, more recently. So here is the uh, uh, performance over um, uh, year to date. Um, the gray line is the um, FTSE All Share Close Ended Index. I did say that we don't put ourselves against uh, this as a benchmark, but uh, it is helpful um, to see. And obviously, as you can see, it's had a very tough time over the past year. Um, and our share price and ALF have, have uh, performed reasonably in line with each other. Um, and we have beaten cash, um, our cash benchmark over that period as well. Uh, this is the very long term graph um, of, um, of performance uh, since 2004 when the trust was launched. Again, healthily um, outperforming uh, benchmark. So our top 10 holdings, the average discount of these is uh, just under 30%. So this is narrowed uh, since around March when it was at its widest at around 36%. Uh, so we have seen some performance uh, in some of our underlying trusts and a narrowing of some of those discounts. Um, looking through um, the portfolio of this top 10, um, obviously I can take questions on any of these stocks um, later, but um, if, you know, talking about corporate activity, we think that you know a good three or four of these um, are unlikely to, to, to be around in the next um, two years. So what have we been doing more recently? So from the end of our interims till uh, the end of August. So the hash line is uh, purchases and the um, solid bars is um, whether the, it's moved up or down in terms of share price. So as you can see, we've made two new purchases, um, three new purchases, sorry, but two purchases in the REITs sector, and that's real estate. Um, again, it's an area that um, should perform well with falling interest rates. And the catalysts for both Aberdeen Property Income, um, well, for Aberdeen Property Income is the trust is in wind down after a failed merger with custodian REIT. Um, so we think that we should be able to um, get a decent return from them selling off their assets. And um, PRS REIT is a good example of um, being able to be involved in more corporate activity and activism now that we're at ABI. Um, and you may have seen um, the uh, requisition that went into the board there um, and the two new board members that have joined um, in order to, to get the best outcomes for shareholders there. We also bought into Bailey Gifford uh, Shin Nippon, so adding to our Japanese exposure. This is a trust that has been in a really horrible area of the market, has underperformed, um, and the trust has fallen to a wide discount. Uh, but we do think that there should be a turnaround of fortunes for this trust going forward. Um, in terms of the um, sales, um, India Capital Growth, we sold out of the last of our um, holding there. Uh, this has been a profitable investment over the course of um, our holding. Uh, again, it was just a, a classic example of where the underlying um, Indian market felt very fully valued. So the net asset value didn't feel that there was much to go for there. And the trust was now trading at par. Um, and so we recycled the money into, into new opportunities. And Downing Strategic um, was the end of um, that realization where they sold off their assets and handed cash back to shareholders. So in terms of asset allocation, what has changed in the portfolio over the last two years? So this is 
um, our interim zone leave in 2022 to our full year in 2024. As you can see in 2022, I mean, I appreciate that this is a bit of an eye test as well as um, a slide, but um, as you can see, uh, hopefully in 2022, we had a huge amount of cash. We felt that the market had got very frothy after the run in, after the sort of COVID bounce in the run of 2021. And um, lots of our trusts uh, were trading at quite wide, uh, quite tight discounts. And so we took um, uh, quite a lot of money off the table. We were around 15% cash at that point. And you can see, hopefully you can see, we've tried to highlight it with the sort of the green um, highlighting around the wheel. But hopefully you can see that dark blue segment, which is the alternative segment, was very, very small because around this time, the alternative sector in investment trusts was still very, very popular. Um, and there was very few trusts that were, were trading on, on wide discounts. If you fast forward to where we've been this year and the two areas that have um, really grown, it's been that alternative sector. So you've seen that we have renewables um, in our portfolio, um, which is a big change from uh, a couple of years ago. And we've increased that private equity segment more into sort of the what the market perceives to be early stage trusts. So Chrysalis, Augmentum, uh, Shahalian and Seraphim Space make up that basket. Um, and those are sort of the big changes that we've seen um, of, over the portfolio over those uh, two years. Really uh, making the most of trusts that um, have, you know, where investors have, have, have punished them uh, with, as interest rates rose. So investment themes and outlook. Um, as I mentioned, growth PE, uh, we saw the example of Shahalian, um, and I just mentioned uh, the other three holdings in this basket, uh, which are very interesting, um, Chrysalis, uh, Augmentum, and Seraphim Space. Um, small caps, what we describe them as Russian doll discounts. So we have um, a basket of UK small cap trusts. Um, and what we have there is layers of discount. So the UK, despite the fact that it's been doing better um, over the last few months. Uh, it's still trading at uh, lower valuations to um, uh, lots of its um, uh, peers. Uh, we have uh, small caps and micro caps trading at discounts to uh, their larger to larger caps, and we have investment trusts trading on discounts that have these kinds of companies. So. Um, you know, once these once these start to move, you should get three layers that are working for you. And finally, I've talked a lot about corporate activity um, over over the presentation, but again, this is happening um, at pace at the moment um, and should be really good for for shareholders. So not much um, left of the outlook that we haven't already talked about, um, but trust sector is emerging from a hostile environment. It's been a really tough time uh, for the trusts. I mean, Nick has been uh, investing for 40 years and this has been uh, one of the more difficult uh, periods he's ever seen. Um, this team uh, are specialists and we now have uh, more resources uh, after our move to AVI. Um, and the portfolio um, is, gives you an opportunity to be invested in uh, investment trusts that you might not have come across um, and are not necessarily as widely known as the uh, sort of the, the bigger ones in the market. Uh, so I'll finish there and I can move on to any questions. Charlotte, thank you very much for your presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions and you can do that just by using the Q&A tab, which is situated on the top right corner of your screen. Just while Charlotte takes a few moments to read the questions that have been submitted today, I'd like to remind you that the recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A can be accessed via your investor dashboard. As you can see, we have received a number of questions throughout today's presentation. And Charlotte, if I could just hand back to you just to run through those questions, that'd be great. And then I'll pick up from you at the end. Sure, no problem. Uh, so please, can you compare underlying discounts in the portfolio with one, three, five years past? Also, are discounts more or less widely spread across trusts? Great question. Um, so let's go with the further story history first. So five years ago, that was pre-COVID, um, and that was about 2019. Um, and uh, the average discount in our portfolio is somewhere probably between 20 and 25. Um, 
and well, probably we nearer 25. Uh, and we were, you know, we were finding opportunities that people um, uh, had sort of written off, were overlooked, were unloved, uh, were not popular, were going through change, uh, those kinds of uh, opportunities. But in that, in, you know, five years ago, when we had very low interest rates, um, there was much more of a barbell in uh, trusts where your very popular trusts um, were trading at, you know, premiums uh, or at NAV. And then there was lots of trusts that had sort of been left behind um, and all were, you know, either had struggled or uh, were going through some kind of change. So five years ago, it was probably a bit of a barbell um and um there was certainly uh you know we were looking for the for the other opportunities uh three years ago uh, you know i think 2021 we saw discounts tightening pretty much across the board uh i mean i think that example of um where the portfolio was in 2022 is probably a good example of the fact that investment trusts had had a really great time uh as the market had a very good time where you know we had that COVID recovery um, and trust performed very well, and uh, we saw quite a lot of tight discounts. And then fast forward to where we are, you know, sort of a year ago, where, you know, trusts that if you'd said in 2019 would be trading on big discounts, things like Scottish Mortgage or Hickel or IMPP, you know, these very popular, very big trusts. Um, if, you know, you'd said in 2019 these are going to be trading on really big discounts, um, I think most people would have found that hard to imagine. Um, so we've seen that trusts across the board um, have had a tough time, um, but uh, we are seeing some recovery. Um, and you know, it's, it's probably sounded like a broken record. Corporate activity has has helped with that as well. I think we're certainly seeing with um, if you look at some of the property trusts, because corporate activity be, activity has been so um, rampant in that area. You know, we're seeing the fact that the turnaround in that sector. Um, does the trust size influence investment decisions, either because of liquidity or wanting to be a meaningful shareholder? Um, so I'm not sure whether you mean the investee trusts or my go size, um, so I'll hopefully try and answer both of those. So um, the we're looking at, hmm, it's an interesting question. So we're looking at, uh, for our underlying holdings, um, we tend to be further down the market cap spectrum. Um, as uh, uh, this investor has um, pointed out, if we want to be a meaningful shareholder and drive change ourselves, uh, because the trust is only around 80 million, that means that we have to, we would be looking further down the market cap spectrum. We often think this is also an area that is more overlooked. It's not as mainstream. Um, you know, there tend to be areas that more mainstream wealth managers can't invest in because of liquidity. So we do tend to be further down the market cap spectrum, but that size has been steadily creeping up over the last few years um, as bigger and bigger trusts have fallen to, to wide discounts. Um, and, but, you know, for the size of our trust, we have been in situations where, uh, you know, we would have wanted to be a meaningful shareholder um, and haven't been able to because of the size of our trust. So, you know, we do tend to stick to, 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 sort of sort of the mid and small cap area but uh, we do get involved in in bigger trusts as well but we tend to think that lots of our investors can can take that take our own view on some of the bigger well more well-known ones and they want to outsource to us finding the, the niche opportunities uh, what is your latest view on the private equity trusts um so we have two um, private equity trusts, but well, we have two of the sort of more mainstream ones. We have um, Oakley Capital and MB Private Equity. Uh, Oakley Capital, um, you know, has performed really well at a NAV level. You know, we um, think the team is, is, is a really good team there and they've made some really good investments. And we've seen that um, coming through over the last sort of few years. Um, it feels to us like it's trading on a much wider discount than is warranted. Um, uh, you know, despite its because of its underlying uh, NAV performance, um, you know, it's had a bit of a, um, it did have a bit of a, a sort of corporate bad boy um, uh, feeling to it many years ago. Uh, but they've cleaned up their governance and are a much more 
uh, professional outfit. Um, and, you know, we think that, um, you know, this is, this is a great trust and we think that the discount there is unwarranted. Um, and then we've been building positions in some of the private equity trusts that um, have some of the smaller uh, and more early, well, earlier stage um, companies. Uh, I think, as I mentioned in the presentation, sort of chrysalis, um, where you're looking for, for opportunities that, uh, to, to watch these companies in their kind of growth, high growth phase coming up into um, either listing or, or uh, being taken out. Uh, we do think that actually the new cost disclosure uh, regulations, so that's taking out the investment trust costs, which have been very, very unfair, um, should also do well for private equity trusts. Uh, they've had to put out very high levels of um, uh, ongoing charges, which are you know have been very unreasonable because it's not costs borne by the shareholders. So uh, that. Um, performance fees and debt and cost of debt etc so we do think that taking that, those away um, should also be a boon um, for, for that area of, of the market as well um, I was just wondering about how part of the ABI stable was going has it brought deeper research capabilities might make my go be able to piggyback on more aggressive API campaigns going forward yes yeah, certainly um, I think that's one of the great things about our move to AVI, they have a long history um, of uh, activism, especially in the closed ended fund um, area. So um, it's been really nice to be sort of collaborative and collegiate, um, kind of sharing in those resources. And as you say, the ability to uh, piggyback a bit on um, some of the uh, activism that goes on here. And I think PRS REIT is probably a good example at the moment of, of that. Um, and, and I can imagine that will probably continue going forwards. Uh, could you talk about your position at AK Capital? Why did you choose this, choose this over other listed private equity trusts? So I talked a little bit about AK Capital and one of the reasons we chose it was because um, we feel that um, the market is maybe looking backwards over to what the trust was like rather than what it's like at the moment. Uh, we think that the market hasn't realized potentially the skill set that um you know in that company and the ability to to generate really good returns um and you know we do think that that discount is unwarranted and that at some point um you know we, we think that that um investors should should uh you know realize this and, and that we should see that discount narrowing um how do you view the growth equity trusts um again i think we've touched on this um do we think discounts could remain at these levels i we think it's unlikely um just in terms I mean, we've already seen as you saw on the graph that shahalian moved um um has, has moved quite spectacularly since um november we think that um there's been some good news out of chrysalis um more recently um and that should um uh, again, help close that discount. We should see, you know, some buybacks, um, hopefully, uh, in the, in that trust. Um, and, you know, the listing of Klarna, um, again, uh, should help with sentiment. So, you know, it's been an area that has, has been shunned. Uh, people have been quite risk off. Um, but we think that the underlying companies in many of these trusts, uh, or many of the companies in these, in these trusts, um, are really interesting, fast-growing, um, and it's it's great to be able to access them at, at such a wide discount. We do think that um, we should see some narrowing going forward. Um, let me just see where we are. Uh, given the large number of renewable infrastructure trusts, why did you pick VH Global Sustainable and Aquila European? Um, so yes, yeah, so lots of the uh, infrastructure trusts have fallen onto quite large discounts. Um, we tend to be looking for opportunities that um, are not in the mainstream, so we you would be unlikely to see us, you know, invested in IPP or a Hickel. Um, and so we're looking for um, situations where we could see a catalyst in that the trusts were very small, and therefore we thought that some some kind of corporate activity would be the natural conclusion. Um, both Ecofin, oh sorry, that's not the right question. Um, both 
VH Global, Annie Giffen, we'll talk about that in a second. There was noticed me, uh, another question come in, and Akila. Um, so Akila has now been uh, pushed into wind down. They've been through a strategic review, and they'll be selling off those assets and handing cash to back to shareholders, which was part of our original investment thesis on it. Uh, we thought it was probably too small uh, to really gain um, traction in the UK market after it fell to a large discount. And we thought that that would probably be the natural outcome for that trust. Um, VH Global Sustainable, that, you know, that's a, a really well-run trust. Um, we think it's a very interesting opportunity in that, um, you know, the trust isn't fully operational yet, and yet the trust um, has, a, has a very high yield. Uh, so we think that that could attract um, some shareholders. Um, and, you know, if not, again, you know, it could be they have some some very interesting, some good assets. Um, and we think that, um, you know, again, that could be that could be one for some corporate activity. But we do think actually that the trust is really interesting um, in terms of its um, underlying uh, investments. Probably um, on to uh, Ecofin, which uh, Ecofin, Ecofin US Renewables. Again, this one is probably of the same theme. I mean, this one has had a particularly tough time um, at net asset value level. Um, they've had problems with rats, they've had problems with hurricanes. So they've been incredibly unfortunate uh, in that aspect. But also the trust, um, again, fell to a large discount before it got to a size um, and it's got to, to, to the capacity that they wanted it to. Uh, again, this is one that's been pushed into uh, realisation. Um, they came out with um, uh, a NAV that was lower uh, quite recently uh, because they increased the discount rate. Um, but we do think that um, the share price has fallen incredibly sharply. Um, and, um, you know, the, the we describe it as probably the bad news is in the price. Um, and, um, you know, we're hopeful that um, with the, how wide the discount is at the moment, um, we should see, you know, some uplifts once um, some of those projects are, are sold. Uh, are we concerned that they couldn't, sorry, there was another, there was a second question, Ecofin. Are you concerned that they couldn't sell a portfolio? Um, not concerned. Uh, we're not surprised. Um, they had a mix of assets. They have wind assets and solar assets, and they have two different types of solar. Uh, they have utility and the other kind, and they have uh, wind assets. So, um, and they've got the geographical split. They have some on the East Coast and some on the West Coast. And that means that it would be quite hard for um, one company to want to take over that entire portion of assets. Um, it'd be quite hard to run um, all together. So we, we was always going to be much more likely that the trust would sell those assets off piecemeal um, individually. And, and then, um, especially as um, the utility assets are minority owned as well. So we're not surprised that they couldn't sell their um, whole portfolio. Um, but it does mean that when they can't, you know, whenever these trusts have to break up their portfolio and sell it off, um, it, you know, it does take, it does take more time um, for, for those realisations to come through. Um, what is your investment thesis for CORD, Cordiant Digital Infrastructure? So we um, think that um, you've got a situation where um, the problems with Digital Nine, which you may be familiar with, with this trust um, took on too much debt and um, the assets um, haven't done particularly well. Uh, this is also in the digital infrastructure um, uh, uh, section of the, of the market. Um, and you've probably seen that, um, you know, the share price has been, has been pretty horrible. The trust is in wind down. They've come out with a NAV that's much lower than the previous one. Um, and the problem for Cord, for Cordian, was that the market sees them as very similar products. And yes, they're invested, both invested in digital infrastructure, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're very similar trusts. I mean, in terms of management, it's chalk and cheese. In terms of debt levels, it's chalk and cheese. In terms of asset quality, it's chalk and cheese. Um, so Cordia Digital fell to a very uh, wide discount, um, despite the fact that actually the underlying portfolio is performing well. Uh, you know, we like the management team. Um, and it was just the contagion, or a, you know, a good part of that was the contagion from what was going on at Digital 9. Obviously, a certain amount of it was um, 
around infrastructure is just more generally, but quite a lot of it has been digital now. Um, but we do think that actually the quality of the management, the underlying assets should um, come through. Um, and, um, you know, we do think that, that the, the, the discount is, is, is unfair on that one. Uh, I think we've gone through private equity um, questions. Um, there was good news announced last week around cost disclosure rules for investment trusts. How long do you think it will take for this to be reflected in a narrowing of NAV discounts across the investment trust world? Yes, so um, it's obviously been a long time coming and it's great news, um, but um, the issue here is that it's not a silver bullet. Um, and it will take time for everything to work through. This is also, you know, an interim measure. Um, so, you know, we, we're, we're pretty optimistic that the current rules will be carried through and, and the, you know, the cost disclosure should, should vanish. But, um, you know, it will take time for all of this to tick through. Um, so it will be, you know, anecdotally, we've heard of managers sort of saying, well, you know, we've got out of, um, you know, sort of the habit of looking at private equity, trusts um and we um you know we're uh, you know we need to kind of get back uh, into 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 you know looking at them again so we don't think that it's going to be overnight it's not going to be an overnight suddenly lots of trusts that had big costs are going to be trading apart but we do think you know at the margin lots of buyers who've been sitting on the sidelines can now come back into, into the world of investment trust. So we do think over the longer term, it will be more very positive, uh, but no, we're not expecting to sort of see um, <laughs> narrowing of discounts in the, in the next sort of two weeks. Um, what is your average time period for holding and sometimes do you go long? So we've had the probably the longest holding we've ever had um, and it's still <laughs> part of the portfolio is um, Uranium Geiger counter. And the um, theme there was, or the thesis there was that the trust, uh, that, sorry, uranium fell to around $30 um, after the accident of Fukushima. Um, but because the price of uranium was so low, it meant that uh, mines weren't able to, um, weren't profitable, mines were mothballed, no one was looking for new uranium, and therefore the um, supply dwindled and dwindled and dwindled against a backdrop of increasing um, uh, nuclear power stations. So we had increasing demand, dwindling supply. We knew that at some point there'd be that turn. And um, we saw you know, a big jump of that at the beginning of the year. We cut that position considerably. At that point, it was about 10%. After the big run, it's about 10% of the portfolio. We've taken it back to just under five. Um, we do think there's further to run, but we do also feel that we've had quite a lot of that. So it's not going to be as big a theme going forward. Um, but that situation took much longer to come through um, than we uh, had necessarily expected it to. Uh, so that was a very long term theme. But if you look at something like Shahalian, when the catalyst comes through quite quickly, you know, we bought that in November and sold the majority of that, uh, of that position in July. Um, that does mean that, um, you know, we can, you know, once, if catalysts come through much quicker, then we're happy to, to move on. Um, but we're also very happy to be patient um, when we can see that there's something coming down that can't coming down the tracks. Um, what do you think will be the main sector beneficiaries from the cost disclosure announcement last week? And any of the three direct China trust holdings, or do you go by EM in Asia? So first one uh, is probably private equity. Um, I think we've kind of chatted a bit about that just because they were trusts that were, um, uh, they were trusts that had to um, put out particularly um, large cost disclosures. So that's probably the, the biggest area that we'll do best, but I think this is probably healthy for the entire trust world. But I think private equity is probably the area that, that will most benefit. Um, and then, sorry, appear to have lost the other part of the question. Ah, so we don't have any China. Um, this is, um, you know, when we look at uh, our process and, and how we, uh, you know, take um, the trust out, this would definitely be in the do we like the asset class. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of stimulus yesterday, so China's had a bit of a run, but we do think that that's probably an economy in decline. Uh, we are very nervous about the politics 
there. Um, so our favoured um, EM exposure is India, Vietnam and Georgia, um, just because you're looking at uh, situations, particularly in Vietnam and Georgia, where you've got a massively growing middle class. Um, you know, in Vietnam, you've got uh, increasing manufacturing. Um, in, you know, in Georgia, you've got an economy that's, that's growing um, you know, incredibly well with very low inflation. And those are more, for us, are more interesting opportunities than, than China. So that's, those are the areas in the sort of EM basket that we're looking at. China, um, we've mostly steered clear of. Um, now you're part of AVI, are you hoping to increase the size of the trust? Yes, we would be delighted to increase the size of the trust. Um, and that's definitely an aim uh, for us. And uh, we do think that being in a home that specializes in trust, um, trust should, should help that. Um, and, you know, we, we would, uh, you know, we definitely like to, to be bigger um, just so that we could to invest in as many opportunities as, as we could and take, uh, I think I, you know, talked about a bit earlier, take bigger stakes in, in trusts and, and become, you know, you know, catalysts ourselves. Um, so, yeah, we're, 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 we're hopeful that, that uh, and that is the, the sort of longer term plan. Um, would you invest in any of the larger, more diversified funds that have fallen out of favour, such as RIT, which is currently trading at a 30% NAV discount? Uh, we tend to not rule anything out. Um, you know, we, um, uh, there's, you know, a lot, everything can go into our universe at any given time. You know, we do say that we avoid some of more of the mainstream trusts, but, um, you know, RIT has certainly come across our desk um, more than once. Um, and it's you know certainly something that's worth doing some work on it. Um, but um, you know I think in this environment the threshold for getting into the portfolio is quite high. Um, and so you know we need to be finding opportunities where we can really see a catalyst and, and why and how and why we can extract that value. You mentioned Digital 9. Did you see the disaster coming? What gives you confidence that Claude won't have similar issues? Um, so a couple of things. Um, so I think I talked about it when I talked about the, um, I did our investment process. One of the things that we say is that we don't like um, that level of leverage. Uh, we are very nervous around trusts that have high levels of debt. Um, and we could see that um, Digital 9 had taken on a lot of debt because they had failed to raise the appropriate equity to do um, uh, the acquisition that we, they were wanting to. Um, I mean, it's difficult to say. Uh, and, you know, we saw that the, the two members of that management team left uh, not long after uh, that acquisition was made as well. Um, so, you know, we do work on underlying portfolio companies. We've obviously done a lot of work on Claudia Digital and their companies. So we do feel um, pretty, uh, you know, we feel much more... Um, much happier with the quality of the uh, underlying companies um, in Cordiant. Um, you know, we're much happy with the management team and we're much happier with the balance sheet. So we don't think that there's, um, you know, much of a read across there. Um, what do you make of the political noise out of Georgia and what is your base case on how you expect it to play out? That uh, is a, a great question, as I have just come back from Georgia. Um, so I was out there doing a research trip, um, uh, not last week, week before. Um, as you say, there's been a lot of political noise um, in Georgia. Um, so the background to that is that um, the government introduced a foreign agents bill, um, which was perceived to have been sponsored by Russia and um, upset. Uh, both the US and the EU, um, and um, there were um, very angry protests in response to uh, the passing of this bill, um, and Georgia Capital's share price um, fell in response to this, um, as investors got quite nervous about what was going on there uh, in, on the political side. Um, we feel... Um, you know, reassured that the election should be free and fair. They're coming up in October. 
Um, we, uh, the underlying populace, about 80% of them want to be part of uh, Europe. So, um, the, um, so we do think that uh, the, um, whoever, whichever uh, party gets into power, uh, they should continue to, to follow that path to joining the EU because it's, it's what the vast majority of their of the, uh, electorate wants. Um, so it was obviously, it's been very noisy um, in sort of around sort of June time when this all happened. Um, but um, we do think that, well, we're, we're hopeful and, and pretty reasonably confident that we should, it should be okay, uh, the October uh, elections. Um, and, you know, for Georgia, this trust is trading on a, a huge distance on Georgia cap, kind of reflecting the nervousness around that political situation. Um, but if you look at the underlying economy and how well that's growing, um, you know, with a backdrop of very low inflation, you've got a growing middle class and you've got the trust that's invested in uh, lots of companies that are benefiting from that growing middle class. So, you know, an education business, the the first thing you do, um, you know, once you, you start making more money is to, to increase the, the standard of the education for your kids. Um, you know, we're looking at the Bank of Georgia that, um, you know, they have still have a shareholding Bank of Georgia. Again, that, that company is, is performing very, very well. Um, so we do think that the underlying, uh, the underlying holdings and the economy are, are, are performing really, really well. The political side of it, um was obviously quite troubling uh, earlier in the year but you know as long as the elections are free and fair in october which we do think they will be we think that we think that that should remain a very good investment um a couple of questions on george i think i've answered that uh, a couple of questions on private equity i think we've talked about that um what do we have um, oh, the future of Hansa if Ocean Wilson sells Wilson Brothers. Yes, so this has been, um, um, this was some very good news uh, that came out of Hansa. Um, what we think with this one is that, you know, we'd like to see it become more streamlined. Um, one of the issues with it is that, you know, there's lots of different pools and pots. Um, and I think it makes it very complicated for investors. Um, so we think that, you know, if Ocean Wilson sells Wilson's brothers, that does mean that that would be a beneficial for the trust at that level and also would help to streamline that portfolio a bit more. Um, so we do think that, you know, if, should the trust become less complicated, we think that that would be the, the catalyst there to see some more investors coming in. Um, and I think that um, is all of the questions. Yes, Charlotte, thank you very much for answering all those questions from Vessi. You've been very generous to your time. Of course, the company can review all the questions submitted today and we will publish those responses out on the Investor Meet Company platform. But just before redirecting investors, provide you their feedback, which is particularly important to the company. Charlotte, could I just ask you for a few closing comments? Um, well, thank you all for your time today. Um, we um, uh, are very appreciative um, of all our shareholders and um, thank you for all of your great questions. Um, you know, I hope it was it was useful. And, um, you know, if you do have any further questions, uh, please do get in touch. Perfect. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Uh, thank you once again for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close the session as you now be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, which I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Mega Opportunities Trust PLC, We'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation and good afternoon to you all.